Hello and welcome to Super Switch Heads, the premier Nintendo podcast in all of the internet. My name is Matthew Stoner. My name is David Howe. My name is Patrick Nisley. And my name is Michael Domang. Yay! Hey! Very special guest, Michael Domang, here in the studio. How you doing, man? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for inviting me here. I'm so happy to be talking about Switch Homebrew. Hell yeah. yeah. That's what we're going to be talking about Michael today. is here. We will be discussing Switch Homebrew. We'll be discussing some job openings uh, at Nintendo, new Pro Controller variant, Ooh. as well as some Switch sales numbers in Europe. Mm. Let's get right into the news. Well, I, I did want to give what one caveat that we're recording this particularly early for us. So, um, Yeah, that, that's right. Uh, uh, Michael has come from out of town. Uh, this is our first, I think you're our first out of town guest. Oh, thank you. That's yeah, I'm great. pretty sure you came all the way from New Orleans. Louisiana. Just for this, right? Yeah, thank you for the Just plane for travel and the accommodation. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Through the uh, zero ads that we have on our podcast, we have been able to afford. Yeah, we put you up guests. in the days in by Wyndham. <laughs> yep. That's where you're staying at. <laughs> Complimentary coffee. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, that, I will say it's also the earliest in the day that we've recorded this episode. And so, instead of beer, we're all drinking coffee, which yeah. is nice. So uh, I guess the point is, that uh, it is very likely that we are going to have a light news week slash heavy news week next episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. All right, so before we do that, we can get into the news, we'll do some shout outs to uh, some people who responded to our last uh, episode about video game music. We got a lot of cool comments. Um, uh, Steven Flores said he can't join our Gooseheads group because he's not on Facebook, but that's he, fair. <laughs> that is yeah. fair. That is yeah. fair. <laughs> we don't. We, we all can say that at some point. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. At one point, I walked away from Facebook, and then I was back like two days later. <laughs> but he uh, replied, I think, on YouTube that uh, some of his favorite uh, video game music is from the Sonic Adventure series. Oh hell yeah! Oh, Running yeah. around at the speed of sound, baby. Yeah, yep. Sonic Adventure <laughs> Two, particularly maybe. Uh, so that's cool. And then we got some other ones. Yeah, there's uh, tons of comments on our Gooseheads Facebook group. Uh, some love for Dragon Warrior from Austin, mm -hmm. Banjo Kazooie, Golden Sun, and Rebecca, who was a previous guest, uh, mentioned some Akira Yamako, Eternal Rest. Yeah, lots oh, yeah. of lots yeah. of music got posted there. Um, so another reason to come join and check it out. And yeah, maybe... check out the comment thread. And then also, uh, Flores, if uh, you don't have a Facebook, that's okay. We also do have a Discord yeah. uh, that we'll be sure to uh, link in the description of this episode or on YouTube at least. If you'd like to join us, that's a good way to join the community. Cool. Uh, then we'll get into the news. Uh, Nintendo tweeted out in Japanese uh, some job openings for the Zelda Breath of the Wild sequel that they're working on. And Google Translate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's our that's our best source. <laughs> the, uh, the official Google Translate uh, app on Google tells me that it's a level designer and scenario planner. So, of course, this sends people into a tailspin of, well, does this mean the game's far along? Does this mean the game's not far along? Uh, and it could mean anything. Mm -hmm. Right? So this is this is confirmed specifically for Breath of the Wild. They too. it says that, and it has pictures of of the images from the trailer. Okay, right. And the in the thing similar, I suppose, and it literally says for the Breath of the Wild right. sequel. You would have to assume they're using the same engine as Breath of the Wild. For sure. So in terms of development, that's got to be the largest portion. Yeah. And so level design you would hope would be quicker once you got those places. Yeah, and I'd imagine, too, in an open-world-style game like Breath of the Wild, where so much of the missions and events and dungeons and whatever shrines that you do are so kind of scattered and in smaller, almost like tapas-style portions, you know what I mean, kind of throughout the world, I think that you could be doing level design and you know scenario design Late into late. the process, at any point in the process, really, whenever yeah. you need to add something new to pepper into the open world. So I don't think that this necessarily means that they're like figuring out, you know, sure. the story or levels or something like that. I think this is more like filling out the world. There, we, there's so many unknowns; it's almost not worth speculating. But it could also be for DLC. You know what I mean? Like it could be for future stuff that they aren't even. Maybe they're done with the game. Yeah. It's coming out tomorrow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I, I, I do want to say, uh, I want to give a little shout out to my girlfriend, Sasha, who finally has picked up Breath of the Wild and is just completely 
immersed and obsessed with it. Oh, yeah. And so it's like, so Breath of the Wild has been like coming back up in my life again recently. And I've been like, even picking up my own game because of, I'm like feeding off of her enthusiasm. I saw for, that you had it yeah. been playing it recently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm definitely more hyped for Breath of the Wild 2 than I've ever been. At and this point. I guess that answers that question. We talked about whether she was going to play Link's Awakening or Breath of the Wild first. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a good idea that she went with Breath of the Wild first, just because you can fucking, it's so like empowering that game. You know what I mean? You feel like you can do anything. Uh, some people have reported that there is potentially a new pro controller variant out in the wild. There's a, people have noticed that some of the pro controllers at stores have a different serial number. And um, that led people to start taking them apart and looking at things like the D-pad. And there are some slight differences. Are there slight differences in the D-pad? Yeah, that's what Spawnwave says. Mm -hmm. uh, whether he, Spawnwave, again, thinks that it's not a huge improvement, but it's a slight improvement. So I guess if you're going to go out and buy a Pro Controller, look that up and pay attention to the serial number before you do that if somebody's looking to, to buy one. Yeah. Um, they already did a slight Pro Controller uh, right. revision, right? This is another potential... Yes, there was, an, there was a, I believe, another uh, serial number at some point as well. Mm -hmm. So just which, something to pay which attention allegedly to. allegedly fixed some of the D-pad issues, but... Same, same sort of thing. Maybe a slight improvement, but... Yeah, I I I would imagine I have a pretty early on pro controller, and I've never had any complaints That's good with to it. Hear. Really, yeah, you haven't had complaints. any like false drops on Tetris ninety nine? No, or I mean I've had Joy Con drift just like everyone else, right. but my pro controller has been treating me pretty well. Yeah, that's good. My cousin's pro controller. I went over to his house recently and was like, "Oh, you got another pro controller? Cool. I don't need to bring mine anymore." And then I started playing with his old one, and I was like, "I can't." I'm like using the stick and I'm like, I'm not being able to like, we're playing smash fast fall or run or anything. He's like, yeah, mm -hmm. that's why I got another controller. That's <laughs> so weird. Yeah. I was like, okay. So they had, that stick has some problems too. It is weird to be in an era of Nintendo where like all their hardware isn't just like fucking rock solid. Yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely. It's like historically, like, you know, this, this is the company with the, the game boy that plays after a bomb was dropped on it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's just a little strange that just kind of using your controllers makes them break, but yeah, we'll see. At least they're doing well. <laughs> <laughs> it's bad, but it's not that bad. Yeah, it's yeah. whatever. Um, uh, so you, you mentioned Austin earlier. I was talking to Austin last night about Pokemon because we were hanging out. And Austin is deep into Pokemon news. And we're just going to give the most surface level Pokemon <laughs> <laughs> news straight now. He was telling me all sorts of shit. Mm -hmm. But uh, Ponyta is a shield exclusive. We were Galarian about Ponyta. Galarian Ponyta Jesus. is a shield ex ex exclusive. Right. Someone's got to be the Pokemon expert on this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Somebody. <laughs> who? <laughs> David, that's you now. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Yeah, that's Take it away. <laughs> is it because I could pronounce... Zacian and Zamazenta. <laughs> Precisely. I can pronounce sword and shield. <laughs> sword him on and shield him on. <laughs> so um, there you go. Yeah. So so basically, the My Little Pony Ta is the shield exclusive to Sir Fetched Sword exclusive. Right. So there might be more exclusive Pokemon that they haven't announced yet. In fact, I imagine that yeah. there will be. Right. Um, but uh, but yeah. So it kind of. That's already a pretty good indicator on which one you want to get. If one of those two spoke Pokemon's kind of speaks to you more, yeah, then um, then yeah, maybe maybe consider getting one over the other. Uh, this was uh, I'm just stealing this from Austin, but his theory was that they're going to let some stuff not be announced because people were upset at the last. I guess was it Sun and Moon that they made everything known in advance, yeah, and that the way that they've been trickling out such little information and we're still a month out, yeah, was his theory. So I mean, we've gotten a lot of information. That's collectively, true. collectively, yeah. there's a lot of information, yeah, but yeah. Um, there's some some things I guess that are still out there, and we're still not a hundred percent sure which Pokemon aren't making it into right, the game. that right. kind of a thing. Yeah. yeah, we don't have like a full list of. Pokemon. So, uh, moving on from Pokemon, uh, our expert. <laughs> Say that with a little less disdain <laughs> next time. <laughs> Pokemon. Uh, the Nintendo Switch. Nintendo announced that the Switch has sold, uh, I guess, over at this point, probably 10 million units in Europe, which uh, is a significant number. Um, so I guess people. It's an in interesting number, right? Because <laughs> it's like, it's not. It's like it's sold almost ten million in Japan alone, right? You know, and there's so a lot more people in Europe. You'd think it'd be so. higher, maybe. Yeah, I, I mean, think... it's culturally obviously there's cultural things to take into account there, right? But um, but yeah, it's you think it'd be a little bit higher. I mean, I know it's sold like a shit ton in the in North America, right? So, um, but it's still a huge milestone. Ten million is no small number. I'd be kind of curious to see like breakdowns by country too, because I, I yeah. hear that France is really into it right now. Yeah. But I'd be curious what other countries are or aren't. You know, um, 
You, David, you added this one. I hadn't seen this news. Nintendo is going to refund some Joy-Con charges. Yeah, this was something I saw on the uh, Nintendo Switch subreddit, and um, basically was confirmed by a couple of people as well. And it's basically if you uh, had to pay for a Joy-Con drift repair in between when your warranty was up and before they started doing these free repairs, Nintendo will apparently refund you. So they have wow. documentation of the drift repairs that they've done uh, throughout the history of the switch and um yeah if you had to pay for joy con repair during that time they will definitely refund you i, I think that only counts for joy cons like i had some like pro controller right uh, stick repair that i had to have done my stick wouldn't drift it would just stick up in the top left corner if i pushed it up to the top left top left corner but i paid like 30 bucks for that um that's fine that doesn't seem to be as big of a widespread issue that might have yeah. even just been my own personal body right. gunk getting in the controller <laughs> but uh <laughs> that's the last time i'll say body gunk on this podcast <laughs> <laughs> never say never <laughs> i'll say that with a little less disdain next time uh, <laughs> but, but uh yeah so apparently if you have to pay for joy con repairs in the past um Call them up. They'll refund you. In North America. In North America, yeah. Still no love from NOE for free Joy-Con repair, it seems. Right. Yeah. Uh, there's some games on sale that you wanted to mention, David? Or? Oh, yeah. I just wanted to quickly announce that uh, this is breaking news. <laughs> uh, uh, just uh, Resident Evil 0, 1, and 4 are all uh, 10 bucks off right now in the eShop, making them a far more... Um, appropriate price for those games instead of the thirty dollars for the featureless, like Nintendo Switch featureless games that are ports that are currently up there. Um, so I, I think that's probably a pretty good deal for Resident Evil Four. So if you haven't played that game, now's a good time to jump on it. Uh, and then also, I think if you pre-order uh, Resident Evil Five and Six, they're also ten bucks off. Um, so there's a big Resident Evil sale going on right now. If you're looking for some frights, cool. It's it's October. It's fright. It's fright month. Fright yeah. month. Yeah, yeah spooky. <laughs> Spooky time. And uh, not that anybody was thinking this would happen, but I guess Cyberpunk 2077's not coming to the Switch. Damn! <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of people have been really excited about CD Projekt Red because this is like the week that Witcher 3 is coming to the Switch. And Witcher 3 was thought to be like an impossible port. Like, I definitely... You know, we talked before it was announced that it could possibly happen, but it was kind of like, ah, you know, that'd be cool, right? But it is happening. Uh, you know, it doesn't look amazing, but it is happening. So that's led some people to really question if uh, CD Project or CD Project Reds, uh, <laughs> they're Polish, uh, new game will be coming to the Switch, and they've said that it's 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 pretty impossible. So obviously don't count it out i mean maybe if we get like you know maybe on like a switch 2 or like a switch pro or something it could right. run a port like that but i would not hold your breath okay uh and then we talked the other week when we were talking about casual games about brain age being announced for japan and wondering if and when it would come west well they announced it for europe at least uh i don't at least as of the other day i i had not seen any announcement for north america uh, and it's a slightly later release, but not like a year later, like the original Brain Age. So January 23rd, 2020, it's coming out in Europe, but we don't know if and when it, it's got to come North America. Once they, once they do, like, yeah, be... if you do the localization <laughs> for Europe, yeah, well, they do use different numbers than we do. <laughs> mm. Roman count, numerals. You can count a different number of birds in England than you can uh, in the U.S. And I think they said with the Europe version, it comes with the stylus. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, I the physical, right. the physical yeah. edition will come with a, a full stylus. I'm gonna go ahead and make a, a, a guess that it, that won't be the case in North America. Well, that's that was the that was true that would, for was it? for Mario Maker Two, right? That yeah, was that's the why European I'm version kind of stylus. Yeah. yeah. Oh, jeez. <laughs> wow. Yeah. They um, don't like to give us extras here. Well, if you need a stylus, I bought a box of like twenty <laughs> styluses on Amazon for like five bucks. If you need a stylus, just come to my house. I'll give you one. Okay. Here's my address. It's. <laughs> no, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> Well, awesome. That's all of our news. For Like I said, we're recording a little early, so uh, we don't have a ton of big news, uh, but there you go. Um, so yeah, I guess we're going to continue taking little breaks. We'll take a short break. And we're back. All right, so Michael, we <laughs> we don't really do breaks. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, we, we revealed that last episode. Wow, well, okay. that we take the breaks. That was a good break. Yeah, yeah, great break, nice great break. break. I got refreshed and I'm ready to go. Let's yeah. do this, Michael. You're here because we wanted to talk about switch hacking slash homebrew and kind of what that means and what that is. 
um, and how you do it and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I guess I would be just kind of curious to just to define our terms, kind of talk at the top, like Absolutely. what does this mean? What's the is there a difference between hacking homebrew? What does it mean to hack a console? And and maybe we can get into the history of that too. But yeah, for sure. But uh, first, starting off, what does what does hacking your switch mean? Hacking your switch in these days would mean mostly you're doing what's called custom firmware. So mm-hmm. you're taking the operating system that the switch uses uh, is known internally as Horizon. Okay. So you're taking that operating system and you're replacing certain aspects of it with uh, firmware that's been designed by the community. Uh, in this case, the primary custom firmware is called Atmosphere. Okay. Um, so you're using that custom firmware, or at least that would be the one I'd recommend. Because um, right, there's a few versions. Right? There's, there's like a paid OS even that you can There do. is. There's a paid OS that's used mostly for game backups, and I right. don't like even using their name necessarily. Sure. Um, yeah. Because they use a lot of the same code that Atmosphere is actually coded on. Right. And they're um, just making you pay for it. Exactly. That's pretty scummy. Um, yeah. So with custom firmware, there's a lot of things that you can do in addition to homebrew, which would be software designed by the community that runs on the Switch. So that's the difference between those two terms, right? Exactly. Hacking's a more general term. Than- and Homebrew is the software that you put on a hacked Switch. Exactly. Right, right, mm-hmm. right. And so with uh, custom firmware, there's certain things that you can do that uh, Nintendo didn't originally originally design for, such as overclocking your Switch is mm. something you could do, uh, running cheat programs, sort of like uh, Game Shark back in the day. Oh, but yeah, yeah. You can do sort of those type of uh, codes on your system. Mm-hmm. You could back up your saves, uh, which was available as Homebrew well before Nintendo Online provided that service. It was mm-hmm. Game Genie in my day. So. Ah, gotcha, <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> yeah, he's like, I use the game shark. Uh, but, but yeah, and then you can also install like kind of custom themes and folders and all the stuff that people have been wanting from an OS update. There correct? is, yeah, there is um, customization that you can do. I would say, you know, and probably we'll get into this later as to what Nintendo will ban you for and what right. they won't ban you for. I'd right. say any sort of customization of the system is actually uh, what would trigger a ban. Or oh, possibly okay. trigger that's a interesting. Ban. interesting. Yeah, well, that's something we should definitely get into later in the yeah. episode. Um, maybe before we get too much deeper into what the Switch is capable of, just like a little history of like yeah. modifying systems in general. Because, yeah. I mean, it's been around since, you know, you since the computer days right so i think know, exactly on a computer anybody anybody can mod anything because you it's, you have access to your own operating system well, and then and the code of the games directly through your, you know unless you're playing on some client terminal or type thing or something like that but like uh or you know google stadia mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um but uh so i guess that's where you know, like there's, there's, you can install mods on PC and and all mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. But and yeah, that, where did that, where, where does that fit in with consoles and the history of that? If you think back to the '80s, where you had a lot of game consoles that sort of doubled as PCs, think of the Commodore 64 as a great example of like a computer video game console that you could write your own programming for. Mm-hmm. And homebrews and demos came from that. The Amiga, really popular in Europe, not so much in the U.S. Um, had a lot, uh, had a huge homebrew scene. Um, and then when I sort of think about modern homebrew and modern console hacking, um, you know, with the Nintendo and Super Nintendo, it was mostly just about backing up your cartridges onto a right. floppy or a CD. Like even though, like the Famicom disk system in, exactly. in Japan was a, kind of a hotbed for piracy because a lot of people were able to back up their games onto discs. Um, by kind of like reverse engineering the disc system. I know, like, uh, have you ever watched any modern vintage gamer? I was going to say he's a great guide for all of this and going into the history of those. Yeah, systems. yeah. I watched. I just watched. I think one of his most recent videos was on a device uh, for the N sixty four. Did yes. you see that one? Yeah, and that was another way to kind of like back up your N sixty four games to like CD ROMs. You know what I mean? And like, and and that was a great way to. And I think actually one of those systems was used by Acclaim like as kind of rudimentary dev kits. I think a Turok game was actually partially developed using yeah. Yeah. a game <laughs> wow. backup device. Yeah. yeah. So it's, there's no shortage of the history of, of modding that you can look up online. What's um, the name of that person? If people want uh, to watch modern that? vintage gamer, he's an Australian gentleman, um, who's a great resource. Um, I know personally, uh, my modifying and kind of hacking, 
uh, began with the Wii for me. Yeah. Um, I, I, I had a modified Wii and I even modified the virtual Wii on my Wii U because it's very, very easy to do. Mm-hmm. If you're thinking about sort of systems that had golden ages of homebrew and had a really large community, I think the Dreamcast was one of the first. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> uh, because of how quickly sort of its security was defeated. Mm-hmm. Uh, the PSP had a very massive homebrew scene, oh, yeah. an emulator scene. Um, the Wii was just a, a absolute gold mine because the hack that sort of first broke it open worked on Twilight Princess. Right. And so almost anyone who owned a Wii at that time owned a copy of it. So it was very easy to get into it. Right. And there was also like the Smash Stack yeah. Uh, yeah. hack, which was like using Smash. It was like the two most popular games, basically. Exactly. <laughs> so you're like, saying you could use an exploit in those games to to get into the OS or something like they that? They would rewrite the name of your horse, uh, Epona. They would rewrite it a certain string that would cause the system to become exploitable. Nice. And it was just a saved game hack yeah. uh, for Twilight Princess. And so now with the Switch... Um, that we're now in another sort of golden age of homebrews that you have, I believe, millions of Nintendo Switches out in the open that have a certain defect or certain hardware bug. Mm. That you don't need it. like a specific game to hack the Switch. You like, just need a specific serial number of right, Switch. Right, right. One of the OGs. Uh, mm-hmm. And real quick before we before we move on from kind of the history, uh, I just wanted to say like when it what. It's always interesting to see when a game, a specific game is needed to crack open a system. Cause like on the DS or the 3DS, for instance, like they would find these like really shitty like shovelware like <laughs> games that were like released in GameStop, like for children that nobody would ever buy. And they were just crappy games. And uh, you know, it's probably if you made one of these games, you listen to this. I'm sorry, <laughs> but, like, <laughs> but it's a crappy game, <laughs> but they're not popular games. Right. right? Yeah, and yeah, like, absolutely. and then all of a sudden, like, you know, they're selling lots for, of copies. I, I, I don't remember the specific one for DS. Do you remember one of those? I don't remember, but I know that the resale value of it shot up exactly. to like 50, 60 dollars. Well, for example, let's just say it was Corey in the house, right? <laughs> and, and Corey in the house, like all this, which was selling nothing all of a sudden on eBay is going for like 200 bucks a copy or something like that. And the value would just go up significantly. That's always kind of interesting and <laughs> funny to see. Um, yeah. So, but you started to talk about how switches, how how people got into hacking the switch. You want to tell us a little bit about, yeah, how that first started or what people's exploits have so been so the, far. The primary exploit, I, f- I forget the name because it's it's slightly French, if I'm not mistaken, fusy gelé or something of that sort. Uh, but the actual bug is. Uh, the GPU of the Nintendo Switch is an NVIDIA GPU. And it's the same GPU that was used on the NVIDIA Shield, which right. is their sort of hybrid tablet platform. It's the X1, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, the X1 right. is, is right. the GPU on that. And there was um, the documentation for that was widely available. NVIDIA posted it online as part of their sort of open source um, mm-hmm. Platform And so people looked into it and found that there was a way to get into the recovery menu of of the switch. And it turned out it was the power button, the volume up and the home button. But it wasn't the physical home button on the switch. It was a pin inside of the Joy-Con rail. Right. That so if you press down on If you do that, all those at the same time or something? Exactly. You can reset. You can set your system into what's called RCM mode. Gotcha. Mm. And by doing that, you are able to send fi- a file into the system. And like then through the USB? I, I through imagine. the USB-C yeah. port on the bottom. Um, and so I, I have it somewhere, and, and I guess I'll give you all some links to what it's available Mm-hmm. But um, it's basically it's a it's a piece of hardware that stores a file that you plug into your USB C port and it sends that file in it. It's so like a payload, I'd imagine. Yes, it's my like a payload injector. Michael yeah. is holding something that looks like a really fat USB stick. Exactly. Right. <laughs> and then this little bad boy, oh, and, and now uh, he's holding something that's very small. <laughs> <laughs> um, slides into the Joy-Con rail and it shorts two pins on the Joy-Con rail. And just by using those two things, you now have complete hardware root access to your Nintendo Switch. There's no firmware update 
that can defeat that access. Right, yeah. So so that's kind of the main difference because Nintendo, especially in recent years, has really cracked down or has attempted to crack down on hacking and homebrew as much as they possibly can. Like in the early days of the Switch before kind of this exploit was found, I know there were some other ways that they were kind of like changing up the firmware to stop people from getting in, but then that would kind of get easily defeated really soon. Yeah, if, anything, anytime you get a firmware update that says something about stability improvements, that's yeah. a big meme in the, in the hacking community right. is like, stability intensifies right um that is almost always to defeat some exploit that has been put out into the open. right 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 um so yeah the, it seems like they're very much aware of the situation and that's even why i know like there's this most recent kind of v2 revision of the switch but even before that like midway through the first kind of generation of the switch if you want to call it that there was a hardware um revision that stopped this from happening correct Correct. so it's like so there's only a very specific serial number yeah there's a batch of serial numbers that are exploitable consoles Uh, all that information is available online right um the new switches the ones that came i think the red box switches i don't know what they're called some of them if you're on the right firmware version there may be an exploit released in the future that's not hardware but it's software that will work uh, and you know they're always they're working right now on the Switch Lite and the the new new switches. <laughs> and um, Switch Lite would be crazy. Yeah, you can figure that out. That that's going to be difficult because yeah. you don't have that dock support that would probably allow you to send data right. the, the same way. There's no Joy-Con rail to, to <laughs> exactly to, to, to connect. So correct me if I'm wrong. What you're saying basically is the the main slash only way to hack your Switch is at this time. To have uh, this original version of the Switch, like you have to to get one of the OG ones. Like if you went out and bought, if somebody was like, I want to go buy a Switch and hack it today, they would have to be real. If Yeah. They'd if, probably have to buy a used one or, or, or find a shop that's had one. And an old Walmart somewhere yeah. in the boondocks that still got some original Switches. Do you know yes. if the value of those original models have gone up because of this? I would imagine slightly. I yeah. haven't looked at eBay myself. I mean, I have a day one Switch, so I yeah. knew pretty easily that mine was going to be okay. Okay, right. but um, the community I don't think is that large enough to inflate prices. Right. But if it became even easier down the road, then yeah, I could see those mm-hmm. those systems going up in value. And then, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but as I understand it, the payload that you have to kind of inject into the switch to the USB C drive, you have to do that every time you want to boot it into this mode. Correct. That is incorrect. Okay. That has changed. Um, so now it's more persistent, and it's uh, I keep mine around just in case my system ever crashes. Right. Uh, but it will go into sleep mode, wake up from sleep mode. You can reboot it, and all that will stay in as long as the system has not fully crashed, and you have to do a full shutdown. Uh, the custom firmware is now persistent. That but, is awesome. But if you did a voluntary shutdown. That would if I did a full power off, power off, yeah. Then but I a would restart have to, won't do it. A restart will not. That's very interesting, man. This is making hacking sound kind of good. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe on that. So we've talked about that you can hack and how it works and some of the technology. Maybe we can go into some details about why yeah. a person might hack. Yeah, like what what switch. you can do. Yeah, what yeah. what's the reason? What are the capabilities? <laughs> so let me tell you sort of the three things that I primarily do with it. Mm-hmm. Um, one is there's a piece of homebrew that allows me to turn the switch into an FTP server. Um, okay. So I don't have to take out my SD card whenever I want to change the files that are on my switch. So if you're doing homebrew a lot, you're putting files onto that SD card all the time. Whether right. you're doing updates or adding uh, games or stuff like that, you want to have access to that SD card. So, so you can just download things directly. directly from your computer and transfer them over to the Switch without having to take out your SD card. Cool. I'd imagine a lot of these kind of programs are like PC specific, or do they work with Mac as well? Some are. Some are Mac available. I mean, FTP is just an old file transfer sure. protocol, so it's going to work on almost any. It will work on Linux. Right. Um, and so I use that backing up save files. There are some games I know that with Nintendo Online, you they'll put cloud saves, but some games you won't. You can back up your saves in case something happens like to Splatoon your Switch. or Pokemon. Exactly. And then yeah, can yeah. you also import saves? Um, I believe that is possible. I, I've not personally done it. You mm. know, I've I. I fought for my full Pokedex in Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu. Uh, yeah. uh, so I did not do any sort of hacking to get uh, my 151. Yeah, uh, congratulations. But did you back it up on I, I Yeah, I backed it up once. Yeah, just to be on the safe side. Yeah. Sure. Um, I remember uh, getting my friend's save on uh, PS1 days from Final Fantasy VII. I didn't want to go get Knights of the Round. Right. So I, tran- I used like the memory card transfer 
but like through PC and I was just like wanted to see Knights of the Round for on my own yeah. TV. <laughs> yeah. So it would like, be cool in- to just pull in like hundred percent. You know, like if you didn't want to like necessarily beat a game, but you wanted to have like all the power ups for a game. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm sure there was stuff on those are PC out there, for yeah. a while. Or yeah, yeah. Stuff like that. Yeah. 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 So, okay. You said, so backing up your saves yep. is one of the big ones. Um, And I would say in all honesty, emulation is one of the great features of homebrew. For these sure. Days. Um, what, uh, what emulators do you have on your switch currently? I use RetroArch, mm-hmm. which is um, a, Mainstay on PC and on Raspberry Pi and other mm-hmm. platforms. Uh, it's just a front end for a bunch of different emulator cores. Uh, so I run Nintendo, Super Nintendo, uh, Nintendo 64 works really, really well on Hell the system. Yeah. No slowdown on Nintendo 64? Um, because you have overclocking capabilities, uh, there is not Ooh, slowdown that's on awesome. Nintendo 64 for yeah. the most part. I'll yeah. say some demanding games still have slowdown. Yeah, sure. Maybe if we can break down what RetroArch yeah. is, uh, like specifically because RetroArch isn't an emulator. Yep. Nope. Um, it, as you said, it's a front end and then you can connect it and download the emulators. So it's like a menu and you choose from that menu what you want and it downloads the core, which is the emulator itself. Exactly. So there's multiple sort of emulation projects that are out there that have cores that you can download through Mm RetroArch. Um, so, um, with I think the names, some of them are, are pretty familiar to emulator fans, but like Mupin uh, 64 for Nintendo 64. Right. Is this Beat. NES 9X for... Uh, that's available. Uh, there's some ones that are also available that are uh, more faithful to the mm-hmm. original hardware and therefore have sort of higher requirements. Mm-hmm. Um, and those run on the Switch. No, well, a lot of these emulators also have like save states and... All, stuff like that or I'm I'm aware of almost all of them having save state functionality, mm-hmm. uh auto save functionalities. Maybe like um, the d- speed up functions yeah. and stuff like that. Cool. Pretty much anything you'd find on a PC. Exactly. Cool. There's the it's a pretty robust software suite. It's not a fan port. The team that works on the PC version maintains the Switch version. Awesome. Um, so it's really it's really robust, and they've just uh, started the early stages of Dreamcast support. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah, do you have any Dreamcast games I on have, your Switch? Uh, I have Sonic Adventure and uh, Virtua Tennis. Ooh. Virtua Tennis is my go to like casual game, Does it, and that runs pretty well. Runs pretty well. Ooh, I'm going to have to yeah. try that out. <laughs> uh, the uh, Virtua Tennis, like hitting the tennis ball, that thwack. Oh, it's very satisfying. So, so satisfying. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I still think Virtual Tennis might be the best tennis game. Yeah, ever. it's great. Yeah. I mean, I love that game on Dreamcast. Yeah. Holds up really, really well. Uh, PSP emulation is also a thing. So you could just all those classic sort of handheld titles that you had. Um, and for me, you know, I was really excited for the Final Fantasy games when they got released on the eShop. Um, but I ended up playing, I, I bought Final Fantasy 7 back when I got my PlayStation 2. So I had those discs around. Um, and I ended up playing Final Fantasy 7 prior to the eShop release just right. on my emulator. And so PlayStation emulation is also pretty solid? Pretty solid, yeah. See, that's, I know PlayStation has been historically difficult to emulate correct it's difficult and then sega saturn has also been really really difficult right, based right. on the design of that hardware so it might be better to get panzer dragoon remake than play panzer dragoon <laughs> on your switch absolutely yeah. i'd recommend that i'd recommend that and you know i would say if you if you're looking to play any of these games and there's an eShop version available i'd recommend going with the eShop version right. Right. I'd recommend going that route because you know it's going to be more supported and you know that it's going to have that that built-in switch functionality that people really love. What about uh the emulation that Nintendo provides through through the subscription service is that better or on par with some of the emulation for NES and Super Nintendo games? I would say it's on par. I would say the Nintendo emulation and the Super Nintendo with the stuff they've released I would say it's a lot easier. I mean, (laughs) with with all hacking and homebrew, with everything, no matter if you're on Switch or on PC, it's it's you got to know what you're doing, Mm -hmm. and you have to be comfortable with that stuff. Mm -hmm. And Nintendo's always going to provide the easiest method and the most user friendly method to to access, except when they don't, which is why people do this. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. My experience with like uh, emulation is things will break, like when you do homebrew or any kind of hacking, is that things break and things update and it takes a lot of maintenance to make it work. There's so, an inherent risk as well. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but one of the reasons like for emulation, there are games that I want to play that I can't play like uh super Mario RPG for uh, SNES. Mm-hmm. Like that game's great. 
and the only way to play it legitimately is to get a Super Nintendo and buy the cartridge or a or a Super Nintendo Classic. Is it on there? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh shit! Hell yeah! <laughs> but uh, that well, I've also hacked as well. Oh yeah, really? Yeah. yeah. That's... <laughs> I have like sixty Super <laughs> Nintendo games on my Super Nintendo Cloud. Those are incredibly easy to break, and there's no like online on that, so there's no risk at all. You know what I mean? But anyway, that that notwithstanding, um, I I, I did want to say one reason that you would want to stick with like Super Nintendo Entertainment System, Nintendo Switch Online, uh, or the NES alternative is they added like online multiplayer for all those games, which is something you can't do with emulation, I'd imagine. Well, in RetroArch, it's RetroArch, Arch. Uh, yeah, I, I don't. I, I'll go with Arc. How just do you yeah, say yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's eight bit. Arc. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They have online capabilities. So, uh, is there they have play Netplay as, oh. as an option. It's it, once again, it's a little cumbersome. You right. got you to know your way. Probably read up on it and set it up. And you have to play with somebody else that has a hack switch. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah it's yeah. a much smaller audience. Right. Yeah. I w- I wanted to follow up. You said there were three main reasons that you, at least personally, hacked. And we've talked about two of those, which uh, it was the save, uh, save, saving backup saves and emulation. What was the third? You said FTP. Yeah, yeah, but I'll throw in a fourth oh, one. Heck, you are, we already covered <laughs> all three. Uh, there's uh, there's other classic games that are not necessarily emulated, but are ports. Mm-hmm. Um, so Doom has been ported mm-hmm. to the Switch. I would argue that the homebrew version of Doom is better than the Bethesda dot net sign in release. Didn't uh, Modern Vintage Gamer make that port? For yes, Switch? I believe he yeah, did. Yeah, I believe I think, I'm using his version. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think um, so. That guy knows what he's talking about. Yeah. And, and then in addition to that, there's just like a bevy of homebrew apps. Yes. Right? Yeah. Like just homebrew applications in general that you can download. And and also kind of what David was talking about too, earlier too, like, you know, the Switch has very limited OS in terms of the themes or folders and that kind of stuff. Some people can do those things too through hacking their Switch. Yes, that is a option that you can do. I once again want to state that uh, that type of customization is a possible bannable offense. Well, let's talk about that then, because I'm yeah. curious. Sure. Like, what? Uh, one question I have too is: Do you have more than one Switch? Do you have like one Switch for hacking and one Switch? Because I've played games online with you. Yes, and so you're obviously and you're not- now in trouble by admitting. <laughs> We're all we all have the red <laughs> Nintendo sniper dot yeah. on our foreheads. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, yes. So I have one switch. I like to live dangerously. No. Um, <laughs> um, if w- in doing your research on homebrew and hacking, what you will find is a pretty standard list that people agree on as to Nintendo will ban you if you do this. Uh, and, and, Ninten- and what are those things? Um, downloading games online and trying to play them on your hack switch. So, so those are games you don't own, like exactly. games that have been pirated. And and I'd imagine the way that they would know that is like they look for those specific game codes and then if they recognize that code on it, your system, then that's a strike. Exactly. Right. It's it's all certificate based and you're downloading certificates and they're matching certificates. And so gotcha. uh, they will they have a pretty foolproof method of catching you if at any point you take your system online and you've played something that you do not own. Uh, I, here's my question then, and this is just a dumb question if somebody doesn't know a lot about this. How do you have one Switch and play online? Like, don't you have to have a fully updated OS or whatever? Is that fine? You can you can just follow Nintendo's updates and still... Um, with custom firmware, for the most part, it's about... I would, I'd say on average about two weeks behind the updates, sometimes so they're, faster. So they're figuring it out, and then you can... Correct. Gotcha. So every time you do a system update, you have to wait for an update to come out for your payload, I guess? I, I typically wait for the custom firmware to be updated, and then I will update myself. Gotcha. gotcha. So during those two weeks, we can't play nope, Smash Online? Nope, nope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just out to lunch. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, play a single-player game. <laughs> So yeah, playing a game that you don't own will get you banned, and then modifying a game that you own online, so like hacking your Splatoon save to give you extra speed. That's fair. I think that you should be banned for that. I agree. Yeah, yeah. I agree wholeheartedly. That's like, you know, anti-cheating measures have been in in totally. games forever, mm-hmm. you know, like, right. but there's like VAC on Steam, right? Yeah. Uh, that's like anti-cheat. And so, yeah, that is... Completely fair, I but think. What about modding a single player game uh, when you're not online? Say Breath of the Wild, and, which there are a lot of mods for. This is where things get so fascinating because the same tools that will get you banned on Splatoon while doing it online are the same tools you have to use to mod Breath of the Wild in single player. My understanding is you will not be banned in that case. But would, you've not. 
I've not dabbled. For I've that. not dabbled. That's a risk fully. you're not really willing to take. That because I like playing Smash with y'all. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Thank so, you. <laughs> uh, and so I I don't do that. But I know there is a mod community for Breath of the Wild. And actually, the mod community for that really began uh, with PC emulation mm-hmm. of the game and has expanded over to the Switch. And that, that was kind of like the Wii U version of the game that we get modded a lot, right? Like the CEMU exactly. emulator. Yeah, yeah. What other games on the Switch have? mod communities uh, um i i mod communities i think it's it's breath of the wild and smash are obviously going to be the two largest yeah. splatoon is like an underground community and uh, um, <laughs> the dank depths of the splatoon <laughs> two modding scene exactly I, mean, I have no problem with cheaters playing with cheaters you well, know yeah. I mean? like, if they want to see who can create the most devastating bomb or whatever to ink the whole map well i know back in the other. day i know back in the day there was a lot i mean there's been just the if game modifying in general is its own whole separate conversation yeah. like you know that That's that true. really started with like super mario world right for the super nintendo like rom hacks and stuff like mm-hmm. that for that game i know uh i used to play a mod of brawl um of super smash brothers brawl called brawl minus uh which was itself a modification of brawl plus which was like a balance kind of mod for that game and it basically took the balance and then made Every, so all the characters were even, but then everybody was super powered, right? So it was just like a totally crazy batshit game. I know like the new Super Mario Brothers games have had a lot of mods yep. as well to make kind of like new games, a lot of Mario Kart mods. Yeah, yeah, and I used to like mod my Wii U so I can have like reskins of characters for Smash. Mm-hmm. So like put Dragon Ball Z characters in Smash. Yeah. It's like my dream come true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And one of the things I want to test out, I, I mean, I could say as of now, I haven't yet, but um, Jedi Outcast that just came out, which is a game that I really loved. Uh, that's a Quake 3 engine game and was really easy to mod back at its PC right. day. People have been saying that those PC mods should work on the Switch version. Oh, hell yeah. Cause I played some of those mods. Like the total like dismemberment mods yeah. and stuff like that. that oh, shit was I really love fun. the dismemberment mods. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm eager to give that a test because that's super single player and I would imagine doesn't even check in online, I would hope. Uh, but, you know, testing out those kinds of mods and yeah, there's a, there's a good community out there. I would say it's something I don't approach because I'm using it... Of you know, overclocking and home and emulation are my two go tos. So uh, another reason to mod your switch and something that I've seen online, I, I wonder if you've had any experience with this, is like loading completely different operating systems onto it. Because I know yes. you can you can load Android onto the switch. Yes, I've seen Ubuntu on the switch, mm-hmm. and uh, even I think somebody just loaded Windows onto it for the first time as well. I, I haven't tested recently. Windows. But yeah, I I, I I I probably wouldn't fucking touch. I have a computer for that, but it's like, <laughs> <laughs> but it's like. But I, but I know that you can kind of put, like, say, Android on and play a lot of Android games. Like, you can do Steam Link and stuff like that. Like, I have played Vice City on my Switch using Android. Right. And how, how, what's the risk factor there when you're loading Android onto your Switch? Zero. Okay. I, I could say honestly zero because you're not even going onto Nintendo servers. You're not loading any Nintendo software. You are putting the system into, once again, RCM mode, and mm-hmm. then you're loading Android off of an SD card. Okay, interesting. So those type of alternate operating systems, have fun. Mm. Just you know, go to town. On so would those. you say it's probably a better idea to play emulators through an Android emulation app? Or would you just consider using the homebrew menu and RetroArch? What I would say is that I think you can actually get best of both worlds. Mm-hmm. There's a operating system called Laka, I believe, L A K K A, um, and that is a sort of Linux based operating system that runs RetroArch. And that, uh, that's what you run your RetroArch off of? No, I run it through Homebrew. But okay, gotcha. this is another option. If you have, say, a second SD card that you like to carry around, mm-hmm. and you can just load up all of your emulators and everything through that, that, I would say, has faster support than mm-hmm. running it through the Switch's operating system. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. So that's interesting. That has me very interested like the the android functionality because there's there's because android itself is an open source platform and there's lots of different stuff that you can do with android that i feel like would totally just change the system into something entirely although we all have i mean maybe you guys have iphones but it's like a lot of if you have an android phone there might not be a huge reason to do that for your switch but yeah just playing with controllers on a game like vice city instead of touch controls could be really cool yeah well, I, I thought maybe we could get into some of the moral slash ethical questions related to this issue and just kind of – I'm going to start with like what is probably most of us and most people listening would agree with. You own your Switch. 
you can do with it what you want. Do you agree with that statement? Like, Nintendo would disagree. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, then let's talk. Why would they disagree? You know what I mean? Like to, to like setting aside the whole like w- whether it's fair for them to ban you for things. Just the fact that I bought this device, I can do whatever I want with it, right? Um, and in, in a certain terms, or do, or do you think that's too bold of a statement? I don't think that's too bold of a statement at all. I believe. I believe kind of what you were getting at is that Nintendo has the right to take me off their online services at any point if I break any sort of uh, terms any, any terms of agreements. Fine with that. If they ban me tomorrow, I'll take my licks. Um, but yeah, I bought the Switch and the hardware. I am feel fine uh, modifying it any way I see fit. Um, and yeah, don't have any arguments against. No, Patrick, you were suggesting like, why might Nintendo do that? Yeah, because you were like, well, maybe Nintendo disagrees with that statement. Well, I mean, that's just been something throughout the history of hardware and software modification, right? Is like, you know, there's a group of people, you know, especially the hacking and homebrew community that are like, I bought this thing. It belongs to me. It's my hardware. If I want to open it up and go into the CPU and overclock it and whatever, I should be able to do that, right? But I mean, there has been throughout the history of these systems exploits for pirating games, and thus that's the main reason why a software or a hardware company would want to crack down on stuff like this, right? Sure. Um, so that's kind of an ongoing struggle in the community, and I know, like even Nintendo recently, I read some stories about how there are you know famed modifiers or like people in the hacking scene that have then since gone on to be hired by Nintendo to like find exploits and stuff for this purpose, yeah, right? It's true in like all kinds of hacking, right? Like yeah, or yeah. like security breaches. Yeah, you like hack into their system and send them an email and be like, I've done this, hire me or I'm gonna like, release it on the internet. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. guess like setting aside the piracy issue is what I was kind of talking about. You right. know what I mean? Like which I think I, I would also argue I think piracy is bad. Piracy yeah. is bad. Right? Like um I, I, w- I, I would think like uh, security um, we're talking about a game console, a Nintendo Switch in this case, but uh, if we're talking about cell phones, like jailbreaking an iOS device, mm-hmm. you're opening up the walled garden just a little bit, and it might make that small window uh, someone can break in because you've opened it, and there's a security risk, and then someone can hack into your phone, and then hack into your emails. And Get you your malware. credit card information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or yeah. Whatever. You open that door just a little bit. Um, that Since a game console doesn't have that many online capabilities or access to your bank account information, the risk is lower, but there's still some security risk for accessing your Nintendo account. And um, then your stored credit card there, maybe, I guess. Maybe there. Yeah, Uh I don't know if, Michael, if you know, those might be the risk that Nintendo is thinking um, I would say that was is a possible risk. I think ultimately Nintendo's worry is that by opening up the system to any sort of hacking, the online experience and the experience of other players will be affected. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. I think that you've got a problem with custom firmware is that by la- by launching any custom firmware, you've enabled online hacking. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to do an extra step to piracy, a step I won't talk about in any mm-hmm. detail. Uh, but in we term- officially do not condone cyber yeah. piracy. Yeah. 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 Um, but right off the bat, you have the ability to modify games that go online and go on Nintendo servers. Right. Um, I don't believe you should do that, but the ability is there from Square One, yeah. and so I would see Nintendo is well within the reason to keep their online services clean. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and, and go ahead. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> In my history of like playing online PC games, like if I'm playing Counter Strike or Apex, I know I'm like, playing against some aimbot or like getting headshots. Yeah. Right. And I've played against like on playing Splatoon two online, like people are like dead shotting me yeah. all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I've definitely run into hackers. And on that ex- that experience decreases. I'm like, come on. Splatoon like- apparently like Splatoon one on the Wii U right now is just like a fucking like Hacker just like fest. hotbed for like hackers <laughs> and like and exploits. Oh, so hot people yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> apparently, apparently, like playing Splatoon one online right now is just a total shit show. That's what I've heard. <laughs> Let the cheaters play the cheaters. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just stick to Splatoon one if you want to be hacking Splatoon. Maybe, <laughs> yeah. but um, but yeah, I think something else to kind of take into account here, and definitely something that Nintendo has had a history of Nintendo's frustration with. The emulation and ROM scene. I mean, like you said, you've openly said that that's something that you do. That's definitely something I would be doing if I had a hack right. switch. I mean, and Nintendo now has a good alternative, I think, ultimately, not necessarily like the best alternative, but a pretty good alternative to like the virtual console right now, right? Where at least what they're trying to do, 
I think is respectable. I think like the idea that I get 20 games right now for 20 bucks a year, as opposed to like paying $8 per game for like a classic game, right? Like that's pretty good. And I think that they've, they've definitely releasing some old games, but there's definitely a good argument to be made for if this game is, has not been released since the super Nintendo was out, has no plans on being really re-released for monetary value then. And there's no way to play it other than like finding an original cartridge for God knows how much money should and that be which, against the law right, to which, like play that game if it's not available to be paid for? And if you bought that cartridge, you're not supporting the developer. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Like, so I, yeah, I think we we said we we're explicitly against piracy, but emulation is in that gray area. It is, and I'm not going to sit here and 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 try to have a high horse when it comes to ROMs. <laughs> um, I would say I speak particularly when it comes to sports titles. You think about any sort of licensed title where. NHL 94 yeah. is never going to get re-released. Yeah. Or, or yeah, like yeah. a movie based or like Bugs Bunny game. Or, or like some of the old Tony Hawk games or some of those songs where the music licenses have gone out. You know, like it's, we see all the time, like what uh, DuckTales, the remaster of DuckTales is getting pulled down. Scott Pilgrim versus the world. Scott Pilgrim for is Xbox a 360. Classic it's like classic example. Yeah. Just like that. You just gone. can't get that game anymore. Yeah. 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 Um, and that's a great game that yeah. should deserve to be played. Into Good like the old school beat em up style game. And yeah. I think the emulation community has done an amazing job of the preservation of old hardware and there's some there's a guy out there on uh super nintendo emulation who has just gotten down to the very nitty-gritty hardware and has preserved exactly how the super nintendo operated right and so they're doing a great job of preserving that and games that a corporation has no desire to preserve because there's no ability to make profit exactly and that's 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 really i think a good way to approach it is is the preservation of game history right because as we're getting into an increasingly digital world you know what i mean where like you know especially as we're moving towards something like stadia you know what i mean where you like you know when you buy a game digitally like if you get banned from nintendo like you just lost access to all the money all the games that you bought digitally right you know yeah and so it's like so it's like unless you're buying hard copies of these games a lot of times or if they get taken off the eShop, the only way you're ever going to be able to play this again is because somebody like put the time in to like have this digital online museum <laughs> of, of gaming artifacts. So it's definitely worth, I think, doing it for that reason. And like you were saying, you know, they don't provide if there's no if it's an old game that there's no way to play, then maybe emulation's fine. Similarly, you know, if uh, Nintendo is not providing a way to back up your saves, yeah, then there's an argument made to like, oh, I want to hack my Switch to back up my saves, right? Like mm-hmm. it's the same sort of. I don't think that's a huge ethical or moral dilemma to me to be like if you're not allow- allowing me to back up all this work i've done in yeah. pokemon or whatever Yeah, one of the arguments that i think about is like i have this piece of hardware and i want to play so many games on this one hardware from a, like a minimalism mm-hmm. uh, perspective yeah. Yeah. like i have a lot of games but i don't um i'll buy physical copies but i don't like keeping them i don't like keeping stuff in general so knowing that i can have a digital copy of all of these games and take it with me Mm -hmm. um like it's one my one drive for for, towards emulation Mm -hmm. um if i can like take the cartridges and put them in storage or do something with them but have it all in one place Mm -hmm. is like the perfect thing for me and, and, and these ethical reasons to support emulation um uh, aside nintendo in the past few years has cracked down hard on rom sites yes right and it's like when we've been hearing stories about this like i think emu paradise was one of them yeah and that was you know a site that was a great repository for all these games you can no longer get anymore was just slammed fucking hard by nintendo lawyers and they were sued for like millions and millions of dollars and it's like and so this is definitely something that they don't want to happen with all these ethical arguments aside. There are people out there that will take the collections that are on something like Emu Paradise and like sell them in bundles. Yeah. Or like uh, on eBay or Craigslist or Etsy, you can buy like CD ROMs or DVDs. Or full even of ROMs. like little devices that are made, probably like manufactured come preloaded in, with ROMs. Yeah, yeah. They're like hard drives. A lot of like Chinese like yeah, knockoff Chinese made machines knockoff don't handhelds. give a shit about and, <laughs> IP. Soldier Boys. Yeah. And to be fair, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah Soldier Boys console. <laughs> and to be fair, I'm against all of those. I'm yeah. against any mm-hmm. sort of reselling of intellectual property that you 
you don't own. I mean, I'm against that. I think this is a hobbyist activity and it should be treated as such. Well, and relatedly then, like, you know, you you held up those little devices that you sold, or I mean, sorry, that you bought. That (laughs) That I make in my factory. (laughs) Yes, sorry. (laughs) That you purchased. uh, But you also, and obviously you purchased that from somebody. uh, But we also, you also kind of mentioned that some people are selling, you know, uh, that alternate OS. And so I'm kind of curious about why is one of those things acceptable and one of them not, you know what I mean? Um, not that they're the same thing. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, like, no, I get what you're saying. There are people uh, making money off of this switch hacking, arguably. I would um, say the the device that I purchased, it really just makes what I'm doing easier. And it has it comes with no software or it comes with software to upload the file. But it, in fact, has no ability to defeat the security on its own. It requires... Right the work of the online community. That's why um, like an R4 card is legal, but an R4 card, card filled with ROMs is illegal. And I, I mean, even to that point, the R4 has the software sort of on it to hack it to it. Right. This is just I literally right. just a file server that you plug in. Right. Gotcha. Um, and then with when it comes to selling an operating system, I think if you're selling uh, software that you did not develop, right. uh, that's where I sort of say, like, if you're using the community's work and then adding a nice skin on it and selling it for 30 bucks, that's where I say that's, yeah, sort of that's ethically pretty scummy. dubious. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I would agree. I just wanted to kind of get into that because it's an interesting to d- dynamic, I think. Um, um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, can I ask a question? Because um, I've always thought, and we kind of already have talked about this a little bit, but I've always said that, like, I'd kind of like to get maybe one of the newer switch revisions like the v2 switch the one that's out with the better battery life and then keep my og switch that i have right now specifically for hacking emulation overclocking maybe game modification something like that now uh, mainly that came from my paranoia that if i hacked the one console that i own that i would get banned and i would lose access because i have i've gone all digital on my switch Mm -hmm. like i don't buy any physical games you know so it's like so i'm very paranoid about like losing access to god knows how much money i've put into the e-shop right now would you say that that still might be a good idea even though there are risks riskless quote-unquote ways uh to mod your switch like do you think that it's necessary to get a secondary switch or does it depend on what you would want to do with modification it really depends on what you want to do with it i would say if you are looking to have a switch be a hacked switch exclusively uh disconnect that one from the internet just just know that you're not going online with that switch or maybe make a new nintendo profile or something don't have any of your current stuff on it yeah just don't have unlink your account just and but you should be able my understanding is you should be able to play those digital games Mm -hmm. uh even if you've disconnected from the internet i think i don't know what the phone home requirement is on that but you should be okay for the most part Mm -hmm. um but yeah don't bring it online if you're planning on doing really really heavy modifications Mm -hmm. just because i think it'd be really fun because i've seen there's entire breath of the wild like total conversion mods yeah like there are full games made with that you know basically a sequel to breath of the wild that was made by the community with all new dungeons and all different kinds of stuff like that sounds like so much fucking fun to play yeah and like skins for link yeah yeah i'd want to play as bowsette in breath of the wild (laughs) i'm just gonna say it's the dream (laughs) so uh i should not if I want to hack my Switch, uh, I should do it if I want to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Go for it. <laughs> but it, if I want to play online uh, with my Disney Tsum Tsum friends, <laughs> <laughs> then maybe I should think again before I hack it. Um, be smart. Mm-hmm. Go online. Do your research. Like I said, there's a list of bannable offenses that you can find, and don't do those things. Cool. Um, keep it to the simple homebrew that is out there, and don't try to get too fancy. Uh, w- one last question about that when it comes to risk. Um, I think especially with all the horror stories we've heard about third-party docs, like bricking and frying switches, like, is there any sort... I mean, I know, like, even with... Wii soft modding, there was like some inherent risk on bricking your Wii, right? Is there any risk in this hardware modification with the Joy-Con rail for your Switch of actually bricking the system? Okay, so two things on that. One, I brought my third-party dock with me to Austin, and my Switch is running fine. Uh, (laughs) It's not a Nyko one, is it? No, it's not. It's an Amazon from some factory third-party dock, and I'm going great. You're living dangerously. I'm living dangerously, man. Um, So as to docks, you know. But um, as to bricking... 
when I first started hacking it before some of these nicer devices, I shoved a paper clip into the side of my <laughs> yeah, switch. Yeah. I would not recommend doing yeah, that. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, with any fancy work on your device or with any sort of hacking of your device, there's a risk of a brick. Um, uh, I think it's Eurogamer and Digital Foundry did some really great investigative reporting on what overclocking does uh, to your switch in terms of temperature. Um, and right. it's with the community, the way that the overclocking profiles have been set up, you should not burn out your switch. Right, right. Uh, but by technically, there's like a, they have to put out a warning. Like Exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Don't go, you know, maybe don't overclock like Doom too much <laughs> yeah <laughs> 2016 doom yeah yeah but uh i've i've not i would say your battery life is going to be affected by right. some of the things that you do and by running it too hard i mean i think ultimately the life of your battery might decrease mm -hmm. um if you're doing software hacking eventually you're going to get the urge to do some hardware hacking mm -hmm. uh i've got a i've got a new shell on mine so um i would say that um yeah that that's something to keep in mind that that battery life will be affected by this, but I'm not afraid of, of getting bricked um, so far, so far. Interesting. Just, um, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, just to kind of wrap up my ideas, uh, Patrick, I don't know if we're going to transition to the next section yet, uh, uh, but just in general, like I definitely believe that I'm pro consumer, um, mm -hmm. which is like, if I buy it, then just let me do with whatever i want with it because mm -hmm. my frustration in general is like i had this thing with a screen just let me like plug something into it to use the screen for sure it's yeah. like i have all of these screens i'd love to be able to watch netflix you know yeah, provide, yeah, me, yeah. provide me some legal <laughs> ways to do the things that i want to do right yeah exactly or, or and if not then don't be upset about it or yeah. you know to the and not every niche thing but the obvious ones like backing up your saves or or these old games or whatever yeah um, and then whenever it comes to, um, like resources to learn more about this kind of stuff, like, uh, do you have any kind of good websites, uh, like GBA temp? I don't know if that's still a good website for this sort of thing. GBA temp can occasionally be a cesspool. Um, uh -huh. don't, don't always recommend it. <laughs> GBA temp. That's, oh yeah. 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 That's, that's, of course yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. a site. Um, switch hacks, uh, subreddit switch hacks. Okay. Um, that is a great resource. That actually just that subreddit just got taken over by the team behind Atmosphere. Okay, cool. So it's sort of their now official subreddit, uh, and their moderators can they have a great guide stickied up at the top about what switches can and can't be hacked, and they're a pretty good community. Uh, I think it's the Reswitched subreddit, which is also their sort of primary. Uh, sorry, uh, Reswitched Discord. Okay, um, gotcha. Is a, gr a great community. Um, just going into custom firmware and they have tech support there. Um, so yeah, those would be the two places I'd recommend to get started. And then if you want to install like some homebrew apps, like uh, as I understand, there is like a homebrew eShop sort of there thing, is right? there is there it's is. just like a way to kind of do this without having to go through your computer every time you can just download it directly correct and that, so yeah how, how would you go about doing that uh i would give that a google i don't yeah. remember exactly where i got mine um to be honest but uh, a quick google you should be able to find that one that would be the one thing i'd say just put on your sd card when you're putting in your custom firmware mm -hmm. and then from there you could just be downloading uh in fact they just came out with an atmosphere updater that is a homebrew app so you can awesome. now update your custom firmware from your switch that's great and I guess this stuff is like evolving all the time, right? All the time. Yeah, interesting. Cool. That was a good discussion. That was so good. good about that. Glad it have helped. <laughs> Hopefully, you've left this conversation a little more informed as yeah. to the current state of uh, the homebrew uh, community. On I know Switch. I have. Yeah, yeah. yeah this was very too. enlightening. That yeah, made me so much. nostalgic for Dreamcast era modding. Yeah, dude, you could just burn a CD and just play it on your Dreamcast without any mod whatsoever nope. yeah <laughs> honestly if you find a dreamcast for sale out in the open just get one <laughs> you can, yeah. you can yes. play any literally any game that you want on it completely for free <laughs> maybe i'll cut that out yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe not though moving on to the next segment Yeah, moving on to the next segment. What? Uh, so we we're, we had a short week here, but um, let's go around and talk about what games we've been playing. Anybody you, wanna uh, you want to start? Sure. I don't have anything new for you guys. I've really exclusively played Smash Brothers Ultimate since last time we talked. Mm -hmm. um, since like three days ago. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, like Austin came over last night. We played a bunch online. You know, uh, teams or whatever. Two two 
I can't talk. Uh, and that's really all I've been playing. More, oh, yeah. more World of Light since I started restarted that. Yeah, yeah. Are you, is it, are you still? I'm fucking cruising through. It. It. I knocked it up to hard. I'm beating every. Oh yeah. Legendary. I'm like, I played oh, on I'm hard much too. better at this game than I was. Yeah, yeah. Uh, once you kind of figure out the best way to like use spirits that as too, well, it makes too, World of Light yeah. a lot easier. Uh, I'll go next. I uh, I actually just I installed it last night and then fell asleep because uh, I actually watched the Breaking Bad movie last night starting at like 12.30 in the morning, so I was up really late last night. <laughs> but uh, I wanted to play, and I only really got to play a little bit this morning, but uh, the new ukulele game. Oh, oh. yeah. And, uh, and I've only played the first couple levels, but I'm loving it so far. Nice. Uh, it's like, I'm a big Donkey Kong Tropical Freeze fan. Very similar, obviously. I mean, you know, it, it, it's an interesting thing because it's like, you know, it's a bunch of old, rare developers that worked on the original Donkey Kong Country games. And uh, and it's very much kind of styled off of Retro's take on the Donkey Kong Country games. So it's a little bit of like, you know, a company being inspired by another company and then the original company being inspired by the inspiration. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's kind of this weird feedback loop of a game. But it plays fantastically, and it's got a great style to it. And if you're looking for like old-school platforming fun, you really can't go wrong. It's got a wonderful overworld as well that is kind of like its own little game in and oh, of itself. Okay. Like in between levels, there's puzzles to do on the overworld, and, and there's a lot of actual movement options you can do in the overworld. It's kind of its own little game, which is really fun. And that's uh, Ukulele that so in the Impossible Lair? That's correct. Ukulele and the Impossible Lair. The original Ukulele was like a spiritual successor to Banjo Kazooie, and Ukulele and the Impossible Lair is a spiritual successor to the Donkey Kong Country series of games. Um, so yeah, if you love those games like I did, I would definitely recommend that. It's a great time. Uh, hey. 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 Turn. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my turn. Uh, I've been playing uh, Smash this week, kind of picking up. I played online with, I can't think of his name. Amir? Uh, I played Amir uh, online, and he destroyed me with Falco, because I am rusty. He's but a good I, Falco and a good Marth. Yeah, yeah but yeah. I beat him once with Hero. Uh, <laughs> uh, Not hard to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I've been playing that and uh, playing Untitled Goose Game, completing some of those side quests. And I recently, this morning, picked back up Control since I beat it and doing some side missions. Oh, okay, cool. And exploring some of the lore between control and alan awake so they are they connected they are connected through some of the story and some of the items you pick up because they're both made by remedy yeah that made me more interested in the game yeah saying that so i love it when uh a developer connects games into worlds it's like a tarantino verse (sighs) i fucking love it i love that (laughs) shit and so i've just like been exploring the world finding those items and reading the story and how they connect yeah that's great yeah that's great. Uh, uh, hopefully next week also we'll have a chance to talk about Killer Queen Black. Uh, I can't wait. That just came out like before we started recording this, so I'm very excited to play that game. Me too. Yeah. What about you, Michael? Um, on my PC, I've been playing a lot of Gears Five. Oh, okay. Yeah. Loving Xbox Game Pass uh, Ultimate on my yeah, PC. Okay. What a fucking deal! It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. uh, and Gears Five being in essence free and just having a great time playing that. And then on my Switch, I've been playing a lot of Untitled Goose Game recently, mm-hmm. uh, based on recommendations from y'all. <laughs> um, just showed it to my wife last night, and she is on board. Yeah, and ready to go. So, so you're enjoying that game? Really enjoying yeah. it, and I'm trying to plow through astral chain trying to finish that up trying i'm working on a lot of backlog stuff and gears 5 is getting in the way of that (laughs) uh but trying to get all my backlog stuff done before i start going through shenmue 3 because that's did you you get the beta for or the demo no 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 i didn't kickstart it when it came out so because i was really worried it wasn't gonna happen yeah Um, that's fair (laughs) (laughs) so uh playing through one and two to get ready for three Uh, cool michael have you ever seen the mega 64 shenmue video no uh they do like jackass style pranks that's so um, funny but they like approach people and they're like would you like to play a game of lucky hit <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> do you know do you know anyone who who knows some sailors <laughs> I'm looking for the man who killed my father. <laughs> I'm going to Japan uh, over New Year's nice. for the first time. And if I find a sailor, I'm just going yeah. to lose my <laughs> shit. Drive some pitchforks around. Yeah, yeah. Or wait, what are those called? <laughs> Forklifts. Forklifts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if Driver, I find a put, a, put, put some wheels on a pitchfork. I got you. Go. Gotcha. Uh, and then, uh, uh, can you play the first two Shenmue games on the on the Switch hacking? 
Do you know if those run on the Dreamcast emulator? I have not personally tested Shenmue 1 yeah. because I know PC emulation saw some issues with Shenmue. Right. Um, right. So but, it'll probably be a ways off. But Xbox Game Pass has it for Xbox and PC. The so, first two? Yeah, first Ooh, two. That's on, nice. On Game Pass. And then I, I couldn't help but uh, notice on your Switch you've got a recently played game as Star Wars Pinball. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's good. <laughs> that game is fucking God, tight, damn. right? Yeah, I fucking good. love damn that it, game. Dude. You always talk about Star Wars pinball. <laughs> I it's, love dude, Zen Studios pinball games are incredible. Great. Really solid. Do you have it's a flip fun. grip? Uh, no, I don't. But yeah, you gotta get yourself I, a flip I know, grip. I know. Yeah. I know. It's the way to play that game. Cool. Anyway, that's what we've been playing. <laughs> that's great. Uh good job, everybody. Thanks again, Michael, for joining us yeah, today. Yeah, that was so much for that was a delay. Uh, this is a this is an episode I've been wanting to do for a long time. So whenever you came to us saying like, Hey, I'm gonna be in town and I wanna do an episode on this, it was just perfect timing. I'm really glad we were able to make this happen. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, for uh, sure. Thanks to Corduroy for doing our music. Thanks to you out there for listening. Um, check us out, uh, give us a review on Apple Podcasts, send us a note got something you want to share with us and if you want to find us individually online i am pdyx most places you can find me on twitter matthew m-a-t-h-y-o-u on the internet i am at monolith fiji what about you michael uh you can catch me at at m domang very good and if you're in new orleans check out the uh what's your theater called again the broad theater that's right yeah you got some you're the director of uh, event programming is that correct? I lead up special events, marketing, yeah. IT. I sweep up floors. I do some things. Oh <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. I hear it's a really nice space. I can't wait to come visit it sometime. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you everybody so much for listening to the episode. Uh, this is the uh, penultimate episode of this season <laughs> of <laughs> Super Switchheads. I believe is that correct? I think yeah. that's correct. I think I think we've decided that we're going to end our first season with the uh, next episode, which will be all about town. We're doing a little town hero yeah, episode, motherfuckers. Town that's right. The bit is uh, reaching its logical conclusion. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so be sure you tune in for a very special episode next week where we do a deep dive on the most anticipated <laughs> game of the entire year, <laughs> Little Town Hero by Game Freak. Uh, <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you so much for listening to us. You can catch us on Instagram at Super Switch Heads, on Twitter at Switch Heads. Uh, our Facebook group is currently Gooseheads, but that'll be changing within the next week or two. Uh, and then if you don't have Facebook, again, just a reminder, you can join our Discord. There's conversations happening there all the time. And the bigger that community gets, the more robust it gets. That's the <laughs> stupidest thing I've ever said. The larger it gets, <laughs> the larger it gets. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to the show. We love you very much. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. <laughs>